I'm Chanley Painter with 4TV and I've been talking to True Crime Rocket Science. I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't feel My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. I think you have to stand in the sand as I did this afternoon at Gilgo Beach. One must stand in that flat, featureless, empty, horizontal, monotone domain in order to fully appreciate the contrast with the setting of Ewerman's office on Fifth Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. If one of those domains is featureless, the other is feature-filled. If one is horizontal, the other is compellingly vertical. And what feature could be more impressive than the thing hovering right outside the entrance to 385 on Fifth Avenue? The Empire State rockets out of the sidewalk, a skyscraper that dominates most of New York. It's one thing to simply gawk at the Empire State Building. One must remember our prime suspect is an architect. He would have taken a particular interest in this building of all buildings. And his interest in buildings goes beyond, you know, the typical eye candy for tourists. And so what happens when one walks from the front of his office building to the Empire State and goes inside and goes to the top. Well, that's something that I did. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're enjoying this analysis, the sort of in situ analysis, then uh, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So when, when, you, when you visit the Empire State, when, I mean, when you go inside, when you go to the top, when you're in the, inside the building, when you, that, that's when you get a, a real sense of just how iconic it is. It's part of movie history. It's part of um, American culture. And it has an impressive history, you know, in, ter- in terms of construction, in terms of the history of architecture. That was something I studied at university. You know, it's not just regarding how it was constructed, but the incredible speed in which this was achieved. And so the Empire State, more than anything, is really a feat of engineering. And I think much of New York is as well. New York isn't really just about architecture. It's about engineering. It's about a technology that has been able to empower uh, people's dreams and so when you go to the Empire State you'll find that there are just permanent queues uh, coming out the building you know the, the these queues curl outside the building uh, hundreds of people like ants pitch up every few minutes to join a seemingly endless queue taking them up to the top where they mill and swarm From the top of the Empire State, one truly has a sense that this is one of only a handful of very high skyscrapers owning the Manhattan skyline. Back at ground level, so going from the top of the Empire State all the way back down to Euroman's office at ground level, it turns out that that trash can where Euroman's DNA was retrieved from, uh, from a slice of discarded pizza crust, Well, that trash can is just a few steps from the front of his office building. Probably, Ewerman was munching pizza with the Empire State filling up his eye sockets. It is a view that's tough to grow tired of. Another dimension to this retracing of psychological footsteps is to complete the commute from 
instead of from the station, the Long Island Railroad Station, Penn Station, to the building on the corner of 36th and 5th Avenue, well, it is to complete the commute from Manhattan to Massapequa via the Long Island Railroad. And, and I've done that. It costs about $10. It takes about an hour. And when you do this, when you travel by rail, as Euroman did every single day, every morning, every evening, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out for years, you, you sense the dimensions of the city falling behind you. You sense the almost tidal rise of the city as you approach it and the, and the fall of the city receding behind you as you leave it. The metro and the Long Island rail system have one thing in common. These are um, transport networks that are grounded. You know, it's, uh, in, a, in a transport sense, it's the difference between um, going by rail and flying somewhere. You know, those are the alternatives for the super rich in New York. You can catch a helicopter somewhere. Um, for those who are sort of in the middle, you know, you can Uber or go by vehicle. But, you know, for those who are to some extent worried about a budget, and you are traveling frequently, or you're going to want to take the, the one, one or the other of the rail systems. And what they have in common is, is that the, the rail systems are grounded, they're noisy, they are gritty, and, and to some extent quite dirty. And And also what they do is they take you from a spectacular soaring landscape into a kind of endless spread of the not so ordinary. And where do you think Ewerman stayed? And if you've actually driven into Massapequa as we did, you see that one house after another is actually pretty well put together, pretty well taken care of. And his home really does stand out as a particularly messy eyesore on a quite a pleasant lane. And so you're li- literally going from the extraordinary to the not so extraordinary. And for some people that might not bother them. That might be okay. But, f- but, but perhaps for some it might bother them after all. So what are we trying to measure here? Well, our theory is that the killer was motivated by nagging feelings of impotence. And that's a a kind of a long way of saying self-esteem issues. That the killer didn't feel he was getting the recognition or didn't get the sense of self-importance that he wanted. From the opposite sex, from his fellow man, from society, right? From the um, cultural... Um, setting that he found himself in and let's face it Manhattan is an unusually um, spectacular um, setting it's it's not any city in the world it's quite a hierarchy that takes you from wherever you're going to whatever the hierarchy is in Manhattan when you leave Manhattan and return to it when you head up the Empire State and come back down when you travel from the center of Manhattan that's Midtown Manhattan, which is where Ewerman's office was, outward. Whether to, you can go to Coney Island and look back, you see this sort of cluster of, of buildings that, that are now small needles, almost like Superman's Fortress of Solitude. You see the small little cluster of, of, of skyscrapers, almost like distant jewels, distant blue jewels on the horizon. Whether you're going to Coney Island or Massapequa, you, you do sense a transition, a transition from extraordinary power and wealth, from inaccessible vertical hierarchies to the welcoming embrace of the flat, spread-eagled, not terribly exclusive suburbs. And that then brings us to the bottom line question. Is there a tension between this set of oppositional axes And you might not notice it if you travel this route that I'm talking about 
uh, once or twice or a dozen times. Of course, if you're doing it for decades, of course you're going to experience the tension. Of course, you're going to notice how the fortunes of those on one side of this axis differ from those on the other side. How some are leading charmed lives within a particular set of privilege and privileged circumstances, while others are to some extent excluded from that. And so what does one do with this tension? Well, you either resolve it with an admission that some things are a bridge too far. You know, it's almost like when you're attracted to someone and, and you very attracted to them, but, but you, you realize that they're out of your league. Well, that is something that's going to make life a little easier. Of course, if you have your heart set on that person, um, then you may have a sense of helpless desperation. And that helps, helpless desperation over time can be, begin to become the sowing of a seed in the pit of one's stomach. Which one of these alternatives do you think Hurman felt? Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.